You know, one of the most famous plays that was ever written, and that probably the majority of you have at least quoted a line out of or have seen, was written in the mid-1500s during the Renaissance era. Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare. How many of you have ever seen or participated in a play maybe with Romeo and Juliet? Any actors in here that have seen? And All right, would you all come up here and throw out a few lines, please? Let's, let's start right there. Well, there have been a few famous lines that have come out of that play that even in the 21st century, all the way back to the Renaissance era, we are still quoting those lines. And one of them is, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. In this moment in the play, Shakespeare in his writing was trying to convey that the meaning of uh, naming things and the meaning of that is irrelevant to what it is. That's what he was trying to convey. In other words, you could, you could call a rose a uh, flower with petals and it would still smell like a rose even though you didn't call it that. It sounds very philosophical to say that you could name anything you want and it doesn't matter. And that may be true for a flower, but I don't know about you, our family agonizes over naming our dogs. I mean, we, we, we agonize over trying to figure out exactly what we want to call our dogs. And we, we, we've got two new dogs. One we've had, it's uh, going to be a year this month. And then we have another one that's just a couple months old. I think it's going on four months old. We got the second one to occupy the first one because the first one only wanted to occupy us. So we decided to get him a friend and boy, it has worked out. So we named him Ranger. We talked and talked about the name and we named him Ranger because we have Scout and Ranger. So that makes sense, right? Off to the woods they go. Scout and Ranger on an adventure. At least that I was thinking in my mind, I don't think they got it. But the more I called that dog Ranger, the less I liked the name. I didn't like the name. It just didn't flow out of my mind. It just didn't seem right. So we discussed it again as a family, and we came up with the name Jet because we were going to name him Cole because he's completely black. I mean, he is just completely black. You can't even see his eyes. I mean, if you saw him at night, you'd think a bear was getting ready to attack you. He just is so black. He's beautiful, shiny coat. But we came up with the name Jet, and we found out that when you look up that word, have you ever heard the term Jet Black, right? The term Jet, actually, the definition is black. Onyx, deep black. So we chose Jet. Ever since we named him Jet, it's been perfect. So now we have Scout and Jet. I mean, if we agonize that much over our dogs, what do you think Stephanie and I did when we were having babies? When we were having our children, it was so important to us that we named them something that was valuable and something that, that we knew we were calling them what God would want us to call them. Some of you have been named or you have named your children after a loved one, either one that's living or one that's passed on. Why would you do that? You did it to honor and to respect that person. You did it to carry on a legacy within the one who carries that name. How many of you have a name, either a first or a middle name, that's after a loved one? Anybody in here? That, of course, look at all of those people. You were named after a loved one. I asked my mom about my name, Edward. Why did you name me Edward? She said we'd run out of names. <laughs> Pulled that one out of a hat, you know. So names are important. And, and we, we, we want to make sure that we're calling people by their name. How many of you have ever called somebody by other than their name? You mistook them. You called them the wrong name. And they said, no, no, I'm so-and-so, right? We all want to be called by our name. And we like to call people by their name. Let me give you a few names that some celebrities have named their children. Oh, you already know where this is going. Here, here's a few names some celebrities have chosen. Seven Up. Sparrow Midnight, Speck Wild Horse. I think he or she's actually here. Stormy Day. Now, if this child has a bad attitude, I think we know why. If you're calling a child Stormy Day every day, Surrey, not so strange, but one I picked. How about the next one? 
It's not just tomorrow, it's tomorrow, because it's not unique enough to call your child future. Sunday Molly, and drum roll, last one, Zuma Nesta Rock. Now, I can tell you that none of these people chose these names for their meaning. They only chose their name for attention. They chose their name for their uniqueness, and some of them are obviously made up names. They're not actual names for people. They just pulled it out because they wanted their children to be unique. Well, they're unique only in what you call them, but who knows ultimately really what you're doing to give them a name that's so far out of society's norms. I don't think you're putting a healthy future in front of somebody with a name that's odd because there's nobody going to say, hey, Zuma Nesta Rock, that everybody's going to be like, hey, that's pretty cool. They're going to be like, do your parents hate you? Why would somebody name you that? To name things may be irrelevant based on Shakespeare's idea, but to name people and living things, I think that's a whole nother thing. I don't think it falls in the same category as a flower to name you whatever, because you would just be who you would be. We read in the scripture last week that, that God has a name, but we also know God chose people's names. God actually told people what to name their children. He named Adam and Eve. He personally named the first two human beings that he created, Adam and Eve. Those came from God. Then he told Abraham to name his son Ishmael, and he told him to name his second son Isaac. We know that one of the prophets, the, the, the father was told to name him Jezreel by God. Then we come over into the New Testament, and we know John the Baptist was told, God told Elizabeth and her husband to name that child John. And then the most famous name that God ever gave a human being on earth is the name of Jesus. The angel told Joseph, you're to name him Yeshua. We also see that God changed the names of people who are already in their adulthood. Abram to Abraham. Sarai, his wife, to Sarah. Jacob to the name Israel. Then we come to the New Testament. Jesus told Simon his name was going to be Peter. And then Paul, his name was Saul, and God changed his name to Paul. So we see God obviously doesn't say what's in a name. God doesn't have that idea when it comes to names. And so when we ask that question, what's in a name, as far as I'm concerned, everything's in a name. Everything is wrapped up in what we call you. Last week, we started a, a brand new series titled, I Am. This is God's name. This is what he called himself. We read over in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, where the writer introduced us to God with two different names. In chapter 1, he introduced him as Elohim. In chapter 2, he introduced him as Yahweh. We saw over there in chapter 1, it says, in the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. In chapter 2, this is the story of creation and what happened when and Yahweh made the earth and the sky. Just in two chapters, we see two different names because they have two different definitions. If we go down a couple verses into verse 7, we see in this chapter, in the first chapter, God was creating. In the second chapter, he breathed life into to man. That he created Adam and Eve. He switched what he was doing from creation and things and animals and, and flowers and trees and waters and sky he switched to that which was going to occupy his creation. And the Bible says that he created this man and, and, and all of the, the muscles and the tissue and the flesh and the organs. And think about the miles of, of um, veins and, and all of the electricity that runs through the nervous system, yet it was lifeless. And the Bible says God got down on his knees and breathed the breath of his breath right into Adam's nostrils. And Adam took his first breath. Your breath was given to you by God. The Bible says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. You don't have breath so that you can get mad at the person on 95 who cut you off. You have breath so you can come in here and sing, I sought the Lord 
Come on, somebody. That's why you have breath. God gave you breath. See, when God breathed in, the Bible says God breathed into Adam and he became a living being. God was introduced by the author in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 by different names based on who God displayed himself to be. Elohim means that God is the creator of all things. It tells us that God created everything. Then we go to the second chapter and we have Yahweh, which tells us God is involved in all things, creates all things, involved with all things, which tells us God is powerful and he's personal. He's not just all powerful, but he's personal. A creator could create and walk away from his creation and never deal with it again. But see, what God did was he created his creation and put man in it and got involved in man's everyday personal life. We read about Moses' first encounter with Elohim, Yahweh. We read that when he was at the burning bush, and it's where we got our series title from. And we're going to run through that. I've cut those scriptures down a little bit this week. Moses saw a burning bush that was burning without being destroyed. So he decided to get closer. The Lord called to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. Now, how many of you realize that it was a little trippy for the bush to be talking? Okay. It was strange enough. It wasn't burning up. Now the bush is talking. But what I find interesting is that what came from the bush was Moses's name. Because God's all personal. Aren't, it wouldn't have been weird if he'd walked up to the bush and the bush would have said, Joe, what's up? Hey, John. Moses wouldn't have felt like he was supposed to be there. He wouldn't have felt like that moment was for him. Come on, somebody. But see, God made it all personal and called him by name. So here we see God making it personal. But then we see a conversion moment in Moses' life because Moses is very confused. He, he was a ruler in Egypt. He left Egypt, and now he's out in the desert leading sheep. He doesn't know who he is, what he's supposed to do. He has no direction in life. He's lost. He encounters this bush that calls him by name, and he realizes whoever's speaking out of that bush that he can't see knows him. And he has a conversion moment, and everybody say this. He says what? Yes, Lord. The Lord said, I have seen the troubles of my people that have suffered in Egypt, so I'm sending you to lead my people out of Egypt. And Moses said, if I go to the Israelites and tell them, the God of your ancestors sent me, the people will ask, what's his name? What are you talking about? God sent you. Who are, who are you? Who are you to tell us? What should I tell them? Then God said to Moses, you tell them, I am sent me. This is the first time God's ever called himself by this term. I am, yet I am encompasses two other names, which is Yahweh and Jehovah. So when he said, I am, he was saying, I am all. Yahweh is all personal. But then we've looked at the name Jehovah and realized that Jehovah has seven different definitions. See, you can't take a God who's all encompassing, all powerful, all personal, all involved, and give him the name John. His name, his being, and who he is and how he presents himself has to be described with so many different, different definitions for us to know who he is. Tell them you were sent by Yahweh. I want everybody to read this last line. Ready? One, two, three. This will always be my name. Always. From that day forward, this is how I want to be known. It is how I want the people to remember me from now on. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't changed his mind in the 21st century about what we're supposed to know about him. We're supposed to know he is I am. He is Yahweh, and he is Jehovah to you and to me. I believe every believer needs to know not just the names of God, but the meaning and the significance 
of what it means for you today. See, the tone of William Shakespeare's question, what's in a name, really falls flat when you start talking about the name of God because what's in a name? Everything. It's not irrelevant, is it? It's very relevant. As a matter of fact, God said this over in Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 8. He said, I am Jehovah. Everybody say the yellow. That is my name. Have you ever had to clarify with somebody what your name is? They keep calling you Barbie and your name's Susie? You know I'm Susie. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Barbie. My name, is, that is my name, and my glory I will not share with another, neither my praise with any man-made image. I am God. I am Jehovah. I am. I am. And all glory will be given to me, and I will share it with no one else, and there is nothing man-made that will take from my glory. Do not worship anything on this earth. God is the only one who receives our praise. Last week, we covered a few names of Jehovah. I am your protection, Jehovah Nisi. I am your provider, Jehovah Jireh. I am your healer, Jehovah Rapha. And this week, we're going to begin with, I am your peace. I tried to explain this last week, that I've only put the word your in these titles to make it personal to you, to help me to explain this. But if I was really going to put this the way that it should be, it would be I am peace, I am protector, I am healing, I am provider. He is those things. He manifests as those things. He doesn't have provision, he is provision. He doesn't have healing, he is healing. He doesn't have peace, come on somebody. He is peace. Over in the book of Judges, Chapter 5, we read that the Israelites had experienced the absence of war for 40 years. So at the end, the last verse in chapter 5 of Judges, it says that Israel was at peace for 40 years. But that word peace only means the absence of war. Then you flip one page and you get to chapter 6. And this is how it opens up. It says the Israelites disobeyed the Lord. So he let the Midianites control Israel for seven years. So I want you to see that for 40 years, they had the absence of war. They called it peace. 40 years in the Old Testament represents a generation. Which means the next generation was a disobedient generation. They went away from God. They started worshiping other things. They started involving immorality and changing the nature of their situation. Marrying people who were not of Yahweh's following. Can I say to you, if you're single in this room, do not marry someone unless Yahweh is their God before you marry them. Don't say to yourself, well, I'll convince them on the other side. You're only marrying yourself into disobedience. Yeah, but pastor, he kisses so good. You haven't kissed good till they got Yahweh up in their mouth. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> the Midianites were so cruel that many Israelites ran to the mountains and hid in caves. They lived in cities. They had homes. They had streets. They had plumbing. They had, they had uh, TJ Maxx. They, they were comfortable, but the Midianites treated them so badly, they ran all the way back to live primitive. It was so bad. They lived in caves. They took their children and they lived in the dirt and the dark and the dust because of how they were being treated because of their own disobedience. Just like when Israel was in Egypt and they began to cry out to God and God answered them these during that seven years, these Israelites started calling out to God, realizing they had been in disobedience and they had, they had deteriorated their own lifestyle by their own disobedience. I hope somebody's listened to me. God went and found Moses because they were crying out to him. Well, in this situation, God went and found a man named Gideon. And so we're going to see what happens here. 
An angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. Now Gideon was in the same plot and situation that everybody else was in. And he said, the Lord is helping you and you are a strong warrior. Well, they're living in caves. It's a mess. Nothing's positive in their life. And here comes this, this messenger angel with balloons like you've won the prize. And he's all happy and Gideon's like, what? What reality are you living in? Because have you seen the way we live? And I love the way Gideon responded. I absolutely love it. He said, please don't take this wrong. But if the Lord is helping us, then why have all of these awful things happened? Come on. How do you like honesty? He, he wasn't like, well, praise the Lord. Glory be to God. Just glad to be in church. <laughs> he didn't give the little Christianese answer. He's like, dude, I appreciate your enthusiasm. However... I'm living in a cave and I used to have a house on Main Street. So I don't know why you're so happy in telling me how great things are for me because I'm not seeing it. Now, in studying this, I looked at the angel of the Lord came to him. and I'm thinking, okay, the angel of the Lord, he was a messenger angel. We know that Gabriel's a messenger angel. Gabriel was sent many times in the Bible to bring messages. So maybe this was the angel of the Lord was was. Gabriel, because now, now we have like this, this stark response, this black and white response to the angel, and watch what happens next. I mean, this really tripped me out. Then the Lord himself said, God was listening to this conversation he was having with this messenger angel, and when he came back and said, what? Where is God? Because the search situation is not good. All of a sudden, the voice of Jehovah spoke and said, Gideon. You will be strong because, everybody shout out those two words. Come on, cuz. You will be strong because I am. You could stop right there. You don't have to say another thing if you know who I am is. But he went on to say, giving you the power to rescue Israel from the Midianites. Doesn't this sound just like Moses? Now watch, watch, watch Gideon's response. Gideon replied, but how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest one in our tribe, and I'm the least important in my family. Wah, wah, wah. I don't know if you were the youngest in your family. The least important ones. Believe me, I know. <laughs> hmm. He's saying, what, what are you talking about? Gideon, you can because I am. And can I say to you, whatever you're going through right now, you can because I am. Gideon, your situation is this, but I am. Your situation, I'm going to help you. I got news for you. I am is going to help you in life. Then Gideon changed his heart and he built an altar there to the Lord and he called it Jehovah Shalom. Meaning God is our peace. I'm sorry, I buzzed by that. God is our peace. Now, when we look at the word peace, I don't know about you, I think of tranquility. These are kind of synonyms to the word peace. Tranquility, calm, restfulness, quiet. This is how a lot of you like to show us that you're in peace. You go to the beach and you get out there and you get your little foot up. And we get a little shot of your leg from here down, you know. Toe. You, you had a pedicure before. And, you know, and then we see the sand and the ocean and, and you're like, where are you? I know where I'm at. You're saying... You ever notice you, you, know, you build up for vacation, you pay for it in advance, you get your reservations, you get everybody packed in the car, you're driving, you're going, you're on your way, yeah, I'm heading to tranquility and peace, and you get a flat tire. Okay, 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 no problem, change flat tire, get uh, everything packed back in the car, okay, we're going, you get to the hotel, okay, so we got two suites, the kids are going to be one, we're right next door, connecting rooms, sir, we've got a problem with your room. Tranquility, peace, calm, tranquility, peace. Okay, that all get worked out. You go out and you take that picture, you know, and you let everybody know. They don't know that you are mattered in a hornet at this point. But okay, I'm going to take my picture. Let everybody know on, on social media, I'm having a great time. We're having a great time, aren't we? 
And right after that picture, the wind blows your umbrella over, sandstorm blows you over. You See, this is the thing is we think we can build up a moment of peace. We can create through vacation or some time away peace. And believe me, I hang on to these words when I have them. Come on, somebody. I mean, uh, basically when this happens, I go, don't anybody talk to me. Everything feels good right now. But what I've experienced, listen, in Jehovah Shalom, is when there is no tranquility, when there is no calm, there's no restfulness, and there's no quiet, when the whole world is in disarray around me. God is my peace. I have Jehovah Shalom in the midst of the storm. The Greek definition of peace going over into the New Testament is irene. Irene. It's the absence of war limited to a condition. See, we read over there in chapter 5 that Israel had the absence of war. They called that peace. But just having the absence of war doesn't mean you have peace. But they called it peace, and then they got into disobedience. And in the midst of their turmoil, even while Gideon, Gideon was kind of arguing with God just a little bit, wasn't he? He kind of had a little bit of an attitude. But then when he realized who God was, see, God revealed himself. I am Gideon. All of those things you're saying are your condition. But I'm the God who changes conditions. And no matter what your condition is, you can have peace. Come on, somebody. You can have peace in the midst of trouble. The Hebrew definition, this is the Greek definition, the Hebrew de definition is shalom, Jehovah shalom, to feel healthy and to be whole. Look, it's a state of well-being. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. While all hell is breaking loose, I have a state of peace in here. Because he's Jehovah Shalom. It's not a condition that creates peace. It's a God who becomes your peace. See, God grants you Shalom. It's, it's a gift to you. The blessings of God flowing into your life have to be bigger than the confusion and the catastrophes on the outside. We said this last week that Jehovah Nisi is our protection. Protection is a promise of God, and it's activated by our decisions. In other words, the Bible says, he that dwelleth in the secret place. See, I have to choose to dwell. I have to make a decision to go to the hiding place in God. And through that decision I make, he becomes Jehovah Nisi, my banner, my protection. But Jehovah Shalom is our peace. It's also a promise of God, but it is activated through obedience to God's commands. Because we just saw over there in chapter 6 that Israel got into disobedience. And when they got into disobedience, they lost their peace. When we disobey God and we, we can come to church and we can do all these things and put on, but when we're in disobedience to the word, we're going to lose our peace. But when we're in obedience to God, you have a peace nobody can take and nobody can shake. Come on, somebody. Why? Because it doesn't matter what's going on around you. I've got peace on the inside of me. The New Testament, shalom, kind of takes on a deeper definition because of Christ. And it's this, the tranquil state of the soul assured of its salvation through Christ. How many of you are assured of your salvation? Come on, where are you? This goes on to say this, watch. You're assured of your salvation and so fearing nothing from God. And content with its earthly lot, whatever it might be, your condition has nothing to do with your peace. Come on, somebody. Your circumstance and situation has nothing to do with being settled inside. John chapter 16, verse 33 says this. He says, I have told you, Jesus speaking, you can have peace in me. In this world, you're going to have troubles. Everybody shout out those two words. 
Be brave. I have defeated the world. The reason I have peace, even though I have trouble, is because God's already overcome all of it, and I'm going to be brave. Peace equals bravery. Peace equals bravery. I can be brave because I'm peaceful because God's got it all under control. Oh, it might look like chaos now. It may not feel good now, but you know what? In the end, I'm going to say, look what the Lord has done. Look what God did for me. And you know what? I don't want to lose, I don't want to lose my testimony along the way. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to lose, I don't, I don't want to get upset and lose my testimony all the way through. I want to be saying, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Nisi. Come on, Jehovah Jireh. I know who he is. He makes himself available to me based upon my circumstance and situation. I know his name and I know upon whom I'm called. Over in Philippians chapter 4, Paul says, do not be anxious, do not be worried. Everybody's talking about anxiety. I mean, anxiety is the buzzword of the year. Depression, anxiety, psychologists, and, and all of these people are overwhelmed. They have, there's, there's not enough of them to be able to cover the needs of the people. But the Bible says, don't be anxious. Don't be worried about anything. But in every situation, everybody say these two words, by prayer. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. If you'll do this... And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, you won't have to be on pills. will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If you'll do this, God will do this. Do you see how peace is connected to obedience? When you say, God, I mean, uh, Gideon was like, it, this is awful. And God said, yeah, I know, but I'm telling you who I am. And he said, I receive you for who you are. And Gideon, if you study him in Israel's history, he was one of the foremost generals that ever led the Israeli army because he defeated every Midianite and every enemy of God. Yet what did he say? My clan is the least in our tribe and I am the least in my family. How many of you know, when I am was with you, least doesn't matter. See, when you trust God, peace will come, and this transcends. It goes above. And see, we'll guard. See, peace is a very misleading word. It sounds soft and tranquil and calm and peaceful and whisper, peace, peace. But the Bible calls it a guard. If you want to know what peace looks like, it's the front line of the Miami Dolphins. I mean, think of the beefcakes. 275 pounds of nothing but lean machine that want to mow you over. And the biggest guy is the guy in the center. He's like 310 pounds. And he's a guy who hikes the ball because the quarterback is a little thin rail. They're the guards. And that's what peace looks like. <laughs> Will guard your heart and mind. And you think about this little skinny quarterback goes back. He opens himself up to throw. And he knows that the enemy's coming at him. And they have trained for years and put on all that muscle and weight so that they can crush the quarterback and take him out. But yet he has all the peace in the world to open up and to throw because he's got those guards down there. Can you imagine a quarterback? He, he, he gets a hike and he's all in fear and he's like, you take it. <laughs> because he's afraid? No, he has peace because of his guards. I want you to know peace is your guard. And if you think a 300 pound football player can do something, what do you think God's peace will do to keep your heart and your mind from being anxious? Though a thousand fall at my side and 10,000 at my right hand, God is with me. Somebody shout out Jehovah. Jehovah. Shalom. Shalom. Since we have been acquitted and made right through faith, we are able to experience true and lasting peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not a condition, but true and lasting peace peace. 
You cannot have the peace of God until you first have peace with God. Perfect submission. Get peace with God through Jesus Christ. You can have no peace without the blood, no peace without salvation. But once you receive salvation, you're now settled with God. And then he grants you his peace. Number one, Jehovah Shalom, I am your peace. Number two, I am your shepherd. I am your shepherd. In the book of Samuel, we see the story of David. David was the youngest of eight boys. I kind of identify with David because I'm the youngest of eight boys. David had a sister. I have a sister. He was a shepherd. He watched over sheep. He had a love for God and a love for worship. I don't even know David was a worshiper. He was an instrumentalist. He played instruments and he worshiped God. He was no coward because we know David is synonymous with the name Goliath. Against all odds, he became the king over Israel. And he wrote more than 75% of the book of Psalms. He didn't write all of Psalms, but three quarters of it are written by David. And the first verse in Psalms 23 is, the Lord is my shepherd. I will always have everything I need. This is where we get introduced to Jehovah Raha. Jehovah Raha, God is our shepherd. What's interesting about this as I studied it is it tells me my role in your life. Because the word shepherd is translated from that Hebrew word, it's translated pastor. So it says, God is our pastor. He's the one who watches over the flock. David understood what that meant because being the, large, being the youngest of a largest family and being rejected and being made fun of and being told he'd never rise up, he had the dirtiest job of taking care of the sheep, but he also had the powerful job of protecting them. He understood what it meant, meant to be up late nights watching over the sheep. He knew what it was like to stand in front of giants and have his whole career on the line and killing and taking down that giant. But if you remember, he said, I come to you in the name of Jehovah. Come on, somebody. He pointed to that giant. He said, uh, he said you come to me with a little stick, and a, I mean, with a, a little rock and a, and a, and a sling. You think you're, he said, I'm not coming to you with this. I'm coming to you in the name of Jehovah, the great I am. You think, you think I'm concerned about your size and your weapons? God is with me. See, David understood when he said, the Lord is my shepherd. Because of his experiences in life, he had worked out that God watched over him in all circumstance. He knew what it was like to have the closest men in his army turn on him. He knew what it was like to have a price on his head from the government when Saul was trying to hunt him down. He knew what it was like to be king. He knew what it was like to be in the presence of God and love God deeply, but he also knew what it was like to sin horribly and have it all go wrong for the people he led. David had a whole spectrum of conditions and circumstances in his life. But in that, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 37, I have been young and now I'm old. And in all my years, I have never seen the Lord forsake a man who loves him. I don't even know he knew what he was saying. Jehovah Raha. The Lord is my shepherd. Then he went on to say this, nor have I seen the children of the godly go hungry because God will honor you generation after generation. Jehovah Raha. David said, God has been a shepherd to me. He has led me. He has fed me and he has protected me because that's what shepherds are supposed to do. He corrected me. He directed me. He strengthened me 
because that's what shepherds are supposed to do. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd puts the sheep before himself, sacrifices himself if necessary. A hired man is not a real shepherd. The sheep mean nothing to him. He sees a wolf and he runs for it, leaving the sheep to be ravaged and scattered by the wolf. He's only in it for the money or the position or the prestige or the attention. I'm in it for none of those things. Write that down. You want to remember that. (laughs) I am the good shepherd and I know my own sheep and my own sheep know me. In the same way the Father knows me and I know the Father, I put the sheep before myself, sacrificing myself if necessary. God is our shepherd. Jehovah Raha. God has not abandoned any of us any more than he abandoned Job. He's got his eye on us. He never abandons anyone on whom he has set his love. Nor does Christ, the good shepherd, ever lose track of his sheep. Somebody say, amen. Amen. Would you stand up with me? We hope this message inspired and encouraged you. Thank you for your financial support that allows Summit to bless this community for Christ. If you'd like to give to Summit Church, click the Give link in the description box.